It's right. Well, nice to see everyone that's come along. Thanks for coming this afternoon. Um, I'm going to turn my Bible to three separate verses. We usually work through Mark's, or Mark's Gospel. I have been working through Mark's Gospel, but I've got three distinct verses I wanted just to read with you uh, this afternoon. The first of them is in the book of Ephesians. Um, on a Tuesday night, we've been working through Ephesians, and uh, I wanted to kind of start off there. Uh, so three verses. First of all, Ephesians chapter number 2. Please, Ephesians 2, and verse number 1. Ephesians 2, verse 1 says, And you hath he quickened, or you has he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. You has he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. The second is in the book of Romans, in chapter number 5. There is a theme to these. There is no prize for getting the theme, but uh, Romans chapter number 5, please. And verse number 8, which says, But God commends his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the first of those verses speaks about my death. I was dead in trespasses and sins. The second speaks about the Lord Jesus Christ's death there in Romans chapter number 5. And then finally, please, a little verse in the book of Hebrews, tremendous verse, in chapter number 2 of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews in chapters number 2. And verse number 14, speaking of the work of the Lord Jesus, it says, Hebrews 2, 14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Now that's three deaths. Uh, You might have had a difficulty uh, getting the last of those three. There are three very important deaths in the Bible. The first is my death. The second is the Lord Jesus' death. And in Hebrews chapter number 2, It's the death of death, and that's a glorious thing. Isn't that a great thought? The Lord Jesus Christ has put to death death itself and got rid of it. What a wonderful hope for the believer. Now let's just ask, shall we, for God's help, and let's just bow our heads and pray together. Our Father, we do come into thy presence with thanksgiving. We thank thee for the Lord Jesus. We just uh, immediately see, even in a few verses, that the word of God is full of Christ. And we thank thee, Father, for that. And we thank thee, our Father, that uh, in him we have hope, a unique hope. A hope, our Father, we could not earn, we could not purchase. A hope, our Father, that comes to us, a saving grace that comes to us by grace through faith as a gift of God. And we give thanks, our Father, uh, that we indeed see a finished work in the person of the Lord Jesus. We look to Calvary and we see our Father, one who died for a different reason from the way or the reason that I die. He died for me in my place. And we offer thanks, our Father, for him. Help us, our Father, just to lift him up and to present him, Father. And we do pray that thou would uh, just uh, bring the person of the Lord Jesus Christ to each of our hearts this afternoon as we pray, Father, for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to start in Romans chapter number 5. First of all, Romans chapter number 5. Uh, Some of you know uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I like to do is go on holiday. (laughs) In fact, Yvonne was standing behind somebody in a queue in the chemist the other day and uh, they just happened to make mention of somebody at the surgery who was referred to as Doc Holiday. I don't know who that was, but uh, (laughs) I don't know. I'm going to to research that one out. Uh, But one of the places I like to go uh, is is Poland. And uh, I particularly have an interest Uh, strangely enough, as it may seem, in the concentration camps and in World War II. If you ever get an opportunity uh, to go to Auschwitz, now some of you, that may be the last place in your list to go, but if you ever got the opportunity to go to Auschwitz, uh, Auschwitz number one, there's about four of them, but there's only two left, so Auschwitz number one. And if you were to go to block number 11 in Auschwitz number one, you would find a small memorial plaque you have to go down the stairs. It's in the basement of Block 11 Auschwitz, number one. And it is to a man called Maximilian Kolbe. Maximilian was a priest. 
He was a monk. And uh, one day in 1941, uh, the commandant of the uh, Auschwitz I, oops, Ran Strummer Karl Fritsch, uh, had a problem. One of his inmates had escaped. And what they did at Auschwitz was they just randomly would choose so many people and execute them in the place of the person who escaped. And so uh, Karl Fritsch decided to choose ten men in a, lo- in a row and execute them. He came to one man, Francesca, and Francesca uh, immediately cried out about his wife and his two sons. And in response to that, Maximilian Kolbe took a step forward. And he said, I'm, 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 I'm a monk, he said, I've, I've never had children, I don't have a wife. I'll take Francesca's place. And so he did. They took Maximilian and they put him in block 11 in the starvation cell. And uh, for a fortnight, they starved them to death and finally executed them by lethal injection. He became known as the saint of Auschwitz for obvious reasons. Um, Francesca lived until 1995. He lived into his old age. He was over 90 years of age when he finally died. And he spent his time going about telling people about the man that saved his life, Maximilian Kolbe. Every day, that man Francesca could say this. That uh, uh, Maximilian Colby, he died for me. He took my place. He died for me. And here in Romans chapter number 5, we've got an infinitely more glorious truth than that. Not just that the Lord Jesus Christ took my place, but he took the place of each and every one that would put their faith in Christ. That's a tremendous thing. And if you come into the joy of Romans chapter 5, verse number 8, you too can say, that Jesus Christ, he took my place. He took my death, that I might live his life. In Romans 5, verse 8, it says this, But God commendeth his love towards us, that while we we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God commended his love. You can translate that in different ways. You could translate it like this, that God introduced his love. The introduction that we have to the love of God is the death of his son. It's important, you know, I think so important that we grasp what that verse says. Because if we misunderstand the love of God, we may start to doubt all sorts of things. If, for example, we say, you know, God loved me because I have an easy life. There will will come a day in, in, in your life where you will doubt the love of God because your life will stop being easy. If you say, for example, well, God loved me because he made such a wonderful world. And then you turn on the news and suddenly you have doubts, don't you? Because it's not such a wonderful world. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say that God loved us and therefore we have an easy life or that the evidence of a love of God is peace in the world or the evidence of the love of of, of God is the health of my children or anything like that. The evidence of the love of God is this, that God sent his son Jesus Christ to die for me at the cross of Calvary. He took my place and he died for me. In that wonderful verse of Romans 5, 8, we not only get a glimpse of the love of God, but we also get a a glimpse into the way of salvation. There's a a word that that runs right the way through Romans chapter 5 and particularly into Romans 6, 23. Uh, Romans 6, 23 is a wonderful verse. It's so clear in so many ways and it's also a verse that I remember my brother uh, preaching on many years ago. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, some people find it so strange that uh, when we come to the Bible and we get a glimpse of God's salvation, it's free. It's by grace. And maybe one of the great objections that I hear to the Bible's message of salvation by grace through faith, a gift of God, is this, that surely we ought to get what we are. I'm I'm going to heaven, and I'm going to heaven because... I don't know what you would fill in at the end of that, you know. I remember being at school and you had to finish the sentence. You know, maybe if we wrote that and and we just finished the sentence. I'm going to heaven because... What would the last part of that sentence be? I'm going to heaven because I've lived a good life. I'm going to heaven because I I, I go to church. I I go to heaven. I'm going to heaven because I haven't hurt anyone. I'm going to heaven because of good works. The Bible says none of that works. It's the gift of God. You say, just a minute, that doesn't work. You can't have it as a gift. Listen, the greatest thing that you have is a gift. Your life. All right? What did you do to earn your life? God gave you that life. Is it so remarkable? Is it so strange that when it comes to eternal life, that that too should be a gift? 
It's not so remarkable, is it? It's not so ir- 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 illogical. And in Romans chapter number 5, the Apostle Paul uh, takes that whole theme and, and shows us that just as you received life and, by the way, death from Adam, you inherited it. There was nothing you did to make your life. So too, when it comes to eternal life, you receive that in a, as a gift. A gift. Now, please, it's not, it's not a casual thing. It's an incredibly expensive thing. Gifts don't necessarily mean cheapness. Uh, This is the gift that is the most expensive gift that could ever be given. It's the gift of the person of Jesus Christ. God commends his love towards us. That while we we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And it's a gift that gets us into heaven. And heaven has to be like that. Salvation has to be like that because of what we're like. That's the death of the Lord Jesus. The way into heaven is by his death. The way into heaven is by Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who took my place. Now it wasn't, uh, we, weren't, we weren't in a line up uh, there in Auschwitz uh, facing uh, Karl Fritsch. But we were in a line facing eternal loss, eternal damnation. And it is the person of Jesus Christ who took that step forward and came into time and went to the cross. And the Bible says, he who knew no sin was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And I think it's so clear, isn't it, in Romans chapter number 5, that if there had been any other way to get into heaven, we would never have had Christ. If there was any other way to get to heaven, any other way to have the forgiveness of sins, God would not have sent his son to be beaten, spat upon, and crucified for me. It is the only way. And it's free. Difficult to get round? Let me remind you, the life that you have now, God gave you for free. And eternal life he gives freely too, by faith in his son Jesus Christ. Now, let me just take you over quickly to Ephesians chapter number 2, where we read at the beginning. Let me remind you that this is the only way it can be because of the condition that you and I are in. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, uh, the apostle writes about people who have become Christians and says this, You has he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. We were dead in trespasses and sins. So here I am. Before I've come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, and here's my condition, dead before God. You say, I'm not so sure about that. You know? <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. I mean, I don't really feel that dead. I feel quite alive. One of the things I hear out in the, the big wide world is that, you know, it's the Christians who are the dead folk and everybody else is enjoying the life and living the life. <laughs> As you go through the Gospels, so oftentimes God speaks not just in words but in pictures. And he gives us little pictures of where we are. And uh, all of those miracles are recorded for a reason. They're not just there to give us the details of the life of the Lord Jesus, although they do that, but they also give me pictures of me. And as I look at that blind man, we've got quite a few of them, you've got one in John 9, but as, as, we, as we've got a picture of that blind man, you see there's a man and, and his life is such a dark place. Such a dark place. And there's a man that's deaf that meets the Lord Jesus and his life is such a silent place, he never really hears anything. He just lives by himself in his own little world. Or there's a woman who meets the Lord Jesus at the well and her heart is empty. It's such an empty place. There's a man of the Gadarenes and and he's down there amongst the tombs. His life is is, a pretty terrifying place, actually. A terrifying and lonely place. And a woman comes along and she's been bleeding. She's been hemorrhaging for 12 years and her life seems to be in this kind of balance. It's difficult, by the way, to bleed for 12 years. That's pretty hard going. Normally it would kill you. But she's in such a balance. It just so, so much speaks of us that, that just as the, the lifeblood ebbs from her, she, she manages to kind of replace it bit by bit. So her life is a kind of a death. She's dying a life and living a death. Slowly. On all of that, you put that together, you see that's a little picture of where we are. We're blind. And the light of God hasn't penetrated this heart. And we're deaf. We haven't heard the voice of God. We, we're distant from the voice of God and, 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 and life can be such a terrifying place and at the end of it there's the grave and do and, and you know what we need? We need Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. Did you notice a little word there? That's a tremendous word. What an encouraging word it is. Just a little tiny word. Maybe you missed it as you read it. And you has he quickened who were dead. Past tense. Past tense. Here are people and they've come to meet Jesus Christ, God's son, the same saviour that died on the cross and that took our place. And they encountered the Lord Jesus Christ. And do you remember the story of that man of the Gadarenes? It was a story. Now he's liberated. 
That, that man that was blind and he met the Lord Jesus and that was what he was and now he has seen the light. Now he's come to Christ. Or, or that woman who was dying and now she has life. The transforming power of an encounter with Jesus Christ. You, hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. And, and that condition, you know, maybe I've told the story before, but in, in that condition, we, we, there's one thing we want in our deadness. We want to be alive. We want to be alive. You know, it, our body isn't really designed to die. You, you see that when people die. It's not designed to die. Every part of, of the, the human physiology is designed to stay alive. And every insult that is, that is, that, 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 that is sent to your body, that there's a process that will fight against it. One, one of my old tutors used to say that really to be a doctor, you don't need to do anything. You just need to wait for the body to heal itself. <laughs> so, okay, fair enough. Almost true. Almost true. Not quite true, but almost true. Time can be a better healer than any medicine. It can be at times. Because there are so many systems in place that fight against the diseases. Yeah? So as, you're, you know, as, that, as that infection comes into your body and you have this overwhelming insult of infection and the blood pressure drops, there's, there's processes in there that will push your blood pressure up and raise your heart rate. And the kidneys will kick in and, and they'll try and conserve the, the water and that will push up your blood pressure and, and white cells will be released to kill infection. Every part of your body is screaming, really, keep me alive, I want to stay alive. And here's a picture of this dead individual in Ephesians 2. Maybe it can ring a bell with, with, with us in our hearts because this individual in Ephesians chapter number 2, dead before God, is screaming, I really want to be alive. Verse 3 of Ephesians 2, Among whom also we all had our conversations and time passed in the lusts of our flesh. Flesh. There's a part of me, that final part of the image of God, that final reflection of the God who made me, that recognises that I'm in this dark place, this empty place. And you know what? I need to be filled. Let me quote Robbie Williams. <laughs> There's a hole in my soul and it's a great big place. You can Google that. He made that into a song. Yeah? There's a hole in my soul. That, yeah. What was he reading Ephesians 2? I don't think so. But he was just speaking from what was inside. He knew. He knew that he was made for something ever so much better than, than, than he could enjoy in this world. And Ephesians 2 tells me that. When God is missing from my life and, and we experience something of the darkness of the blind man, something of the deafness of the deaf man, God isn't speaking, I'm not hearing him. Something of the fear of the man of the Gadarenes living in the shadow of the tombs. Something of the dying death of the woman with the issue of blood. And something of that blind panic of Jairus, who knows that his daughter is at home dying and he can do absolutely nothing about it. And, and when that sets in, there is something within our souls that says, I want to stay alive. I want to feel something, anything. And, and, and so we begin to, to grasp at things. Galatians chapter number 5 tells me the kind of things that, that often are features of a life, of a life that's empty without God. Now, verse 19 of Galatians 5. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation. These are big words, aren't they? It's a bad translation, that. But basically, what it means is this, that I, I indulge myself in everything and anything, just so that I feel something. I indulge myself in wrong desires. You've got adultery there, for example, or in excess. Just something that will make me feel alive. I'm so dead. I'm so empty. Ephesians 2.1 You who were dead in trespasses and sins. Dead in trespasses and sins. So God's looking down upon me. And he sees me as dead and helpless. Dead in, not just sins by the way. Did you notice that? The, the Bible emphasises that for us. Dead in trespasses and sins. Sins meaning missing the mark. Breaking the rules. We do that at times, don't we? We break the rules. And maybe sometimes we don't break the rules. We kind of bend the rules. Yeah? But still, we're still, we're still wrong. I just remember an old man coming in to see me a number of years ago and he'd been up to the consultant at the hospital and sometimes they listen to the consultant better than they listen to me, you know. So he came back and he says, I says, so what did the consultant say to you? He says, I need to stop the fags. I says, that's good. He says, I know that. He says, I'm going to do that. He says, and he tell me, he says, I have to drink, I've cut and done a drink. I says, oh, that's good. He said, just one whiskey at night. I said, well, that's good now, John. I said, that's good. 
He said, mind you, he didn't tell me what size of glass was to be. <laughs> right? Bending the rules. Bending the rules. We're good at that, aren't we? We kind of work our way around the rules. God, uh, we work our way around God's, God, 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 God's rules, God's commandments. That, you know, thou shalt not bear false witness. Don't tell lies. So we have a wee white lie now and again. No, we kind of bend the rules. And it's for their good that we're telling them this or doing this. Or we take things that, that don't, don't, don't belong to us. You know, we steal, but well, you know, we're kind of do it and so forth. And we kind of bend the rules and break the rules. But as God looks down upon us, he doesn't see us getting round his rules. He sees that as a mark of the distance between my soul and his, his reality. He sees me as being dead in trespasses and sins, as, as blind as that blind man, as deaf as that deaf man, and, and, and as bound as the man of the Gadarenes. You see, how much, how much can I do? What can I do for a God when I'm dead in trespasses and sins? There's nothing I can do for him. He does it for me. That's what we call God's grace and God's great love. God commends his love towards us. That whilst I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. And that is my only hope. There's nothing else that I can do to get into heaven apart from what God has done for me. Let me take you finally to that little verse there in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews and chapter number 2. Great verse, isn't it? Hebrews chapter number 2. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. My death, that's where I am, Ephesians 2. Christ's death, the great work of the cross of Calvary and the death of death. You know, God loved me so much. Christ died for me. And Christ not only took the punishment of my sin upon himself but he dealt with my final enemy death Ephesians chapter number 2 there's a strange thing as you go through the Bible you'll find that there are a number of occasions in the Bible where it seems that we we just can't get rid of somebody have you noticed that we can't get rid of them do you remember the story of Isaac as he went up the mountain top it's a wonderful story you find it in Genesis chapter number 2 he's a son and he he takes this this piece of wood in the Hebrew language, it's a tree. He carries a tree. It's translated wood. And he carries the tree up, up Mount Moriah. Now, you, you, if you read the beginning of the story, you'll know why he's going up there. He's going up there to die. God had commanded Abraham to take his son Isaac and put him up on the altar and, and offer him up as a sacrifice. A strange request, but Abraham does it. And the strange thing is this, that as you come to the end of the chapter, guess who comes down the mountain? Isaac. You can't get rid of him. You can't get rid of him. Wonderful, isn't it? And there's a man called Daniel later on uh, at the end of the Old Testament of the Bible and, and, and his enemies have a plan for Daniel. They, they don't like him, you know, he's, he's too good, he's too powerful and, and so they decide to, to, to put him in beside the lions. Hungry lions. It's the way that they're disposed of the enemies of the emperors of, of, of Babylon. So they've got this, this, uh, this crowd of lions and, 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 and they, they put him in amongst it and then they seal a tomb. It's like a tomb. You read about it in, in the book of Daniel. And they roll a stone in front of this tomb. That's the end of Daniel, isn't it? It's going to be consumed by those lions. And by the end of Daniel, Daniel chapter 6, isn't it? Daniel chapter 6, they, you know, they roll away this stone in front of this tomb and out comes Daniel. You can't get rid of the man. You can't get rid of him. And then you come to David. Let me read you this, Psalm number 16. Here's David's wonderful hope in Psalm 16. At the end of Psalm 16, wonderful chapter this is. Verse 7 of Daniel, of a, a, sorry, Psalm 16. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My kidneys also instruct me in the night season. I have set the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoice. My flesh also shall rest in hope. My flesh also shall rest in hope. What does that mean? That means he's going to have a good night's sleep. No, he's talking about death. My flesh also shall rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in hell. So I'm going to go into death, but you're not going to be able to get rid of me. You're not, I'm not, going, to, you're not going to leave me there, are you, Lord? Neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. You'll not leave me in the grave or in hell. 
And in fact, you'll not leave me long enough in the grave so that I'll decay. So Psalm 16 speaks about someone who will die, who will be buried, but who will not be buried long enough to decay. And in Psalm 16, you will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. There is running right the way through the Old Testament of the Bible, not only this wonderful story of a saviour who will take my place, who will die in my place. That was the echo that comes out of the book of Exodus. As the nation of Israel came out of Egypt and they came out, uh, whilst every son in, in, in Egypt was put to death, they had a lamb who died for them. They came out because a lamb died for them. And there is also, right the way through the Old Testament of the Bible, this echo of a wonderful prospect and promise of resurrection, and that is found in the Lord Jesus. Hebrews chapter number 2. He's a saviour who not only bore my sin and took my punishment, but he's a saviour who entered into death. And through death, he destroyed him that had the power of death. That is the devil. And in that I rest, not only for my salvation, but in that I rest for my resurrection. You know, I, I sometimes wonder uh, for folks who think there is something that they can do to, to get to heaven, something that they can provide God with. I, I, I wonder really, I wonder really what they really think about what they have to do, you know. What kind, of a, what kind of a plan do we have for dealing with our own sin and our own death? Yeah. I remember a story that my friend told me some time ago. They had discovered someone who uh, carried in the back of his car for his own personal use a cardiac defibrillator. You know, kind of bewildered at this. He'd stolen it, you know, put it in his boot. And just in case he collapsed, he would use his defibrillator. A bit bizarre, isn't it? How are you going to use a defibrillator if you're dead, you know? Did they really get his head round this? I don't think we, we really understand just how big our problem is. There, there, there I am. One day I'm going to be in the grave. Will any of my good works get me out of that problem? Am I, am I able to bring myself back from the grave? You see, when we're thinking about the, the, the greatness of God's salvation and we're thinking about the greatness of our problem, we need a great saviour. One who not only offered himself for my sins at the cross of Calvary, but one who has the promise and gift of eternal life and who is able to deal with me even in death. I give unto my sheep eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand. He is the resurrection and the life. What a great saviour. And his call to you and I this afternoon, John 3.16, that God loved this world so much that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life that's all he asks for us to do is to rest and trust and believe in his son and let him do that great work of his saving grace let's pray our father we thank thee our father for one who who took our place who, one our father who stood uh, in the place that we ought to have had and that ought to have been ours we thank thee our father that god commends his love towards us that whilst we were yet sinners whilst we were in our most helpless state in our least lovable that whilst we were yet sinners christ died for us. We thank thee, our Father, for him. What a great saviour. And we thank thee, our Father, for one who holds the very keys of death and the grave itself. We thank thee, our Father, for one who took our place and one, our Father, who broke through and destroyed death. Oh, we thank thee, Father, for it. We, we, we see little glimpses of where we are before thee right the way through the word of God. With those folks who met Christ, some are, Father, who were in a place that was dark and dismal, some are, Father, who, who were in a place they never heard the voice of God. Some who were in a place where their life was but a death and who lived in constant fear. How we thank you, Father, for a saviour that broke in. And what a wonderful verse that is, Father, in Ephesians 2, that we were dead in trespasses and sins. That for each one that comes in faith to Christ that rests in his finished work, his salvation, we can look back and say that's what we were. And now in Christ we have hope and salvation. So we offer thanks, Father, for thy word. Think of these little verses that we've read and thought on this afternoon. We pray that they, they would bless them. And we do give thanks, our Father, for each uh, friend that's come along. We do pray for a real blessing from the Word of God. We know that thy Holy Spirit is able to take the Word of God and make it really living and alive in our hearts. And we pray, 